Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'd like to introduce Joel who's doing a talk on the long winding road to 10 gigabit um, networking in the home. Um, he's a network engineer, self-proclaimed geek, psych social researcher and a couch surfer. Please um, put your hands together to welcome Joel. Kia ora. Um, I have some bribes, so please do heckle slash shout out, interrupt, or if you see something that's wrong, interrupt me. There's probably people in this uh, room that know the kernel net stack better than I do, so please do educate us. Um, so New Zealand chocolate and also actual New Zealand coffee. So, um, Right, so who am I? Uh, I work for uh, Nokia. Uh, these days, but actually for a subsidy that was originally called uh, Nuage Networks, who primarily do um, software-defined networking um, shim layer for large-scale networks. Um, I work with uh, OpenStack primarily, but also a whole bunch of other cloud ecosystems. So I do large carrier-grade data center networks is kind of what I do day to day. Um, I'm on the internet at these various places, and this talk is on GitHub. So what is the problem? Well, this, this graph kind of sums everything up um, for me quite succinctly. I'm done, not going to be talking about wireless networks, so don't even go there. Um, let's just talk about physical networks. Going back to the 1990s, um, your primary access network at home was probably some sort of dial-up, if you were lucky to have internet at all. So let's, let's sort of start from there and add a little bit more context to this picture. <coughs> so. Basically, from around about the turn of the millennium, um, home networks haven't really changed very much. This, this red line in the middle has, has been flat ever since around 2006, 2007, when gigabit ethernet became pretty much the de facto standard you find in consumer laptops and desktops. Um, the DC has been kind of going up and up and up. 10 gig sort of has taken over as the, like, the standard interconnect, and now 25 gigabit Ethernet is the standard interconnect in the back of a server. Um, this line at the bottom is the even more interesting one. Um, this is your access network speed. So, you know, until relatively recently, it was kind of a given that, you know, your access network was going to be the bottleneck. Um, that's no longer true. For many, many connections in the world now, the access network is now faster than what the home network can deliver. Um, you've got this cap at one gig, it hasn't changed since about 2008. Um, it's been 20 years since the, the, two, the giggy standard's been around and, and we haven't seen any improvement in the home. Um, so now we're seeing uh, basically the access network being faster than your home network. And this is weird, like this, should, this is not the natural order of things. Um, you, you shouldn't be able to pick up a 40 gigabit connection off, off your network provider and then have, have it to be tunneled into a, a, a one gig home network. It just doesn't make sense. And when I say commonly in many places, <laughs> um, one of my pre past jobs was actually delivering the ultra fast broadband network in New Zealand. So I designed the layer three metro ethernet access network with our GPONs and, and the fiber backhaul. Um, Many of my colleagues from that time have since come and gone from MBN over here trying to help you guys out in Australia. Um, but your successive governments seem to be making a, a bit of a mess of it, let's just put it politely. Um, the average connection speed in Dunedin, as released by Chorus, which is our main local fiber company in New Zealand, as of like this month, is now 264 megabits. And this is the average connection speed. So out of all of the 70 odd thousand people in Dunedin that may have an internet connection, um, the average is 264 megabit. And this is, this is only gonna go up. Um, but we've, we're now at a point where this is, this is a problem because once you get into the home, you're, you're actually, you're, you're screwed. You, you, you've got nowhere to go. So there's a lot of moving pieces to this problem. Um, the wiring and cable standards for home networks are not really there. They're there but they're still working in this sort of 1970s, 1980s telecommunications model where it's, you know, industry standards bodies charge you lots and lots of money to look at this thing that's kind of common knowledge. Um, and then they haven't really kept up with basically the technology that's happening in the DC. Uh, the architectures on PCs are um, not so much of a problem, like they're, they're relatively good, 
But the systems on a chip that you see in the gateway edge devices, the CPEs, are woefully inadequate for today's interconnect tasks. Um, there is a lot of equipment on the market that will market itself as doing one gig plus capable layer three forwarding, but in reality, it's using dumb tricks. Um, wireless has completely confused the situation. Consumers have no idea what oh, the internet is slow actually means because it's more than likely it's something to do with the residential oversubscription of the, of the free to air bandwidth floating around, nothing to do with their actual connection speed. So wireless has just confused consumers more than anything else and it hasn't aided the situation. Um, and the other problem is, is that you're still seeing high-end consumer devices shipping with 100 megabit interfaces. I bought a 4K smart TV top of the line last year after searching for several months to try and find something that would work for me. I have a really fast home internet, uh, access network at home, um, and I also have a fast home network, and I want my TV to be able to pick up content off my file shares at line rate, one gigabit. It's not really that much of an ask, but there is nothing. There is one brand I found that had a gigabit sock in it. All the others are using 100 megabit internets, and there's actually a really complicated problem there because they want to hook you into streaming services with these really tightly encoded bitrate streams like Apple, like Netflix, where you know, if you have a, you know, a RIP or a DVD RIP sitting on the NAS, the bitrate of that is probably much higher than what that sock can actually pick up off the, off the wire. So the only way to get 4K content in and out of these um, smart TV platforms is actually via the HDMI cable. It's, it's dumb. They're not smart, they're dumb. Um, and then there's this whole power consumption, legacy interoperability issues with the older um, standards, and of course cost. So, so this is sort of a big, big problem. So let's just look at the wiring situation in the home for a second. Beno did a really good talk yesterday on like the history of I.O. and computing, and he went further back in time than I, I, I'm going in this particular talk where he talked about you know, uh, vampire taps on AUI connectors. I'm not going to go quite that far back, but if you watch this talk, it's also a good adjunct to this one. So this is basically where we're at at the moment. Um, Oops, we've got some sort of timing thing going on there. So in New Zealand and Australia, the, all of the in-home residential wiring standards are covered by these two standards. And these were just updated last year. Uh, I think the residential one is still actually open for submission. Um, the telecommunications commercial one is closed, and there is a new standard issued for it. But um, you can't actually look at these. So what's actually in them? I only have vague ideas based on leaked copies of the old versions that were, you know, 2013. Um, I kind of have an idea what will be in them, but I don't really know. So if you do anything with open governance and you have a kind of a position on this, I suggest you email this email I found on a PDF for submissions about the standards. And, th and these are the custom premises stuff. This is probably going to sit there for at least another five to ten years. So this is worth getting into at the moment. Um, also, why does it cost $300? It's nuts. It's just, it's just a bunch of, like, you should connect this Cat5 UDP with this type of connect. It's just dumb. So let's look at the history of what I've found in my house over the last 20, 30 years. So the first type of fast network I had at home that wasn't a null modem that I'd suddenly hijacked off, off the, the, the telephone port in the, was a coaxial cable. And this is probably a fairly familiar site for those of you of the right age. So, you know, BNC style terminator connectors, it's a shared bus medium. This thing's been around, I think, since the turn of last century. Like, it's a very old format with the shield, with a single copper core, and then a, and then a, a copper or a electric, dielectric shield around that again. Um, it's done very well. This is, this is actually scaled remarkably well for what it is. Um, it's still in common usage today in access networks. DOCSIS 3.1 was just ratified last year, and it's delivering 10 gigabit over this to your house. And that's impressive, because it's just a single core of copper cable. So it, it's done pretty well. You don't see it any, basically in networks at the home today beyond that CPE device, but it's still quite common in things like AV equipment. It's still kind of the cable of choice for a lot of applications. The other thing about coax, it kind of merged into TwinX eventually, and TwinX has been around, again, for quite a long time. It's basically two pairs of coax in a single sheath. TwinX is the undisputed king of the data center interconnect at the moment. 
there is, is no other technology you will find more commonly at 10 gig and 25 gig interconnects with a top rack switch. It has been the perfect media to scale up to 400 gigabit. It's cheap. Um, generally, you're buying it with optic optics attached to the end of it, so there is a very low cost. You don't have uh, buckets of SFPs floating around. They get lost and put on top of people's drawers. Um, and it works, works really well. The latency is also better than optical, so <laughs> a lot of good reasons that TwinX is one. Um, I've never seen it at home, though. Does anyone have TwinX sitting at home? Do you have a carrier switch sitting at your home? For yes, okay, right. So, so you're not a consumer, and, and it's, not, it's not something you'd ever see in a consumer device yet. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a great technology. And you, you, you have these kind of squid cables are kind of the common way that you get port density. You have 100 gig optic, optic. Uh, it's actually electrical, electrical converter, which is a QSFP plus style fact, form factor, and that breaks out into four 25 gigs or four tens if it's a 40 gig. And, and this is just, you know, this is what the day-to-day -day workhorse of the data center is. Um, UDP, everyone loves UDP. <coughs> It's the undisputed home of uh, the king or the owner of the home in both commercial and, and residential settings. And it has been like that for probably 20 plus years at this point. So since coax was ripped out sometime around the end of the 90s from school networks and from commercial premises, um, basically this UDP hub spoke typology type patching systems were put in place. And you'll find this pretty much everywhere. Um, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. We know about it. It's familiar. You've probably got a crimping tool in your toolbox somewhere. Um, but it's, it's kind of done its day. Like Cat6A, which is the, the, the only cable at the moment that's ratified for 10 gigabit, what Cat7 is as well, but Cat6A is basically what you need to do 10 gigabit base T. Cat6 doesn't cut it. It's got a lot of problems. Um, to basically make this easier, they've just released, as of last year, the standard called 8023BZ. Hold on. We're going backwards in speeds here. So 10 gig base T was ratified in 2006. Base X, which is the fiber and, and, and the data center standard, was 2002. Last year, we ratified a standard that was 2.55 gigabit. And the reason for this standard is effectively because basically CAT 10 over copper UDP sucks. There's no really easy way to put that. It's really problematic, so we just basically invented a standard which allows for fallback modes when the cables suck. So on CAT 6, not CAT 6A, not CAT 5E, um, you have this 2.55 gig modes now that you can potentially trans negotiate the link down to when your, your 10 gig is not able to cut it. CAT7, which is a rather better cable than CAT6A and is widely available and is not actually that much more expensive, um, has just been passed over for 40 gigabit. It was on the standards track to be the 40 gigabit medium of choice. But again, it had so many problems. It couldn't get the reach. The runs were problematic. The cable connectors had to be at such a high tolerance, low tolerance, um, that they just went, nah. So currently, there is nothing beyond uh, 10 gigabit that is standardized for UDP cabling. Um, 40 gigabit is standardized on CAT8. <laughs> uh, but yeah, CAT8, and it's not something you're ever going to see in your home. So, so this, is a, this is a prize question. Who can tell me what is wrong with this 8, 8, 8 PAC connector? This is out of spec for 10 gig base T. Who can tell me? And it's almost in spec. Like, it's got some of the features of the newer connector styles. But it's missing a fairly important one. Yeah, go ahead. Shell it up. Um, the wire guide at the back of the cable? At the back of the plug? Yes. Yep. So you, you, that's basically, there's actually two things. So that's one of them. So there's meant to be a wire guide. And that wire guide extends into a sheath that goes around the entire front of the connector. And that provides an extra layer of uh, insulation, effectively. And that actually is part of the 10 base T CAT standard. And it's really rare to see these cables done up properly. Like, I've been in data centers greenfields and they haven't got this right. Um, and you know, you get this wide range of bits that attach to your, um, your, your UDP cabling that, you know, maybe at this point 30 years old. 
So it's, it's just, it's tricky. Um, so yeah, it works. I mean, there's certainly data center deployments that have used Cat6 cabling for their 10 gig stuff, but it's got a lot of problems. The reason it hasn't taken off in the data center and why TwinX has won is when they, when they basically brought out, this, brought out this standard, which came out four years after the fiber and, and the TwinX versions came out, um, the, the, the little silicon that drives each NIC that has a TCAM attached, which is your buffer memory and a few other bits and pieces, um, is 48, 48 nanometer silicon, the older ones. And the SFP Plus standard just doesn't have enough power across the bus. So you can't put in a copper optic into an SFP Plus socket because to do it at 10 gig, there's just too much power draw. So it's, it's just, it's a problem child. Um, and, and Cat6A is pretty bulky. Anyone who's actually run Cat6A and has also run Cat5E in the past will know that Cat6A is not as forgiving. This is a Cat8 cable. <laughs> this is the only picture I could find of one. They're like this thick. This is a pro audio cable. It's designed for interconnecting your incredibly expensive speakers. It's three and a half thousand US. Um, it's really thick. It's basically, it's still eight pairs, it's just more insulation layers, higher AWG gauge wire inside the actual pairs. Um, at the moment, it's the only one that's ratified for anything faster than 10 gig, and we're never gonna see this in the home. So, you know, fiber is cheaper. Why don't we just go to fiber? Like, it's not that bad. So UDP, the future of home wiring? Not sure. So what can I actually do today? So, all right, here's the challenge. I want to be, build a nice, fast, capable 10 gigabit home network. Don't want to break the bank. What can I do? What equipment do I buy? Well, there is almost zero options. Any Kiwis will get this reference. Most of you get Australians probably won't. Um, there is some <laughs> consumer stuff starting to appear. But nah, there is, the, the, the most interesting thing of these are Quanta um, team-based T-NICs that are starting to appear at around about 100, 120 New Zealand price point. Um, so they do a, a BZ pair that'll do five and 2.5 and a 10 gig at about that same price point. Um, they are using a, a 28 nanometer silicon process. So they managed to drive the power consumption down to the point where it's now feasible to, to actually use this in a consumer environment. Um, so they're the probably most interesting thing that you might actually look at if you were trying to build this at home. Uh, there's a few NASAs around, they're like, oh yeah, we've got 10 gig cards, but then the socks on these things are just un underwhelming. Like, you know, apart from the one thing that it probably can do with offload, it's pretty much useless to you. Um, so that kind of brings me to the next point. Um, socks and current gateway devices are woefully underpowered. So to do line rate gigabit, in worst case, with small packet size, you need to be able to process 1.5 million packets per second. Give or take a few thousand, depending on who, how you do the calculation. But that, that's about what you need to be able to do. Now this is fairly easily achievable with x86, has been for many years. Um, ARM can almost do it in some cases. There is certainly ARM stuff that can do one gig line rate, slow pass, and for 10 gig, though, you need to be able to do the same operations at 14 million packets per second, which you can do on x86 at the higher end. <laughs> but doing this on your embedded gateways is a real big problem. So when you start looking for switches and gateways that you can do 10 gig stuff, you will find nutter. All right, here's a nice little picture. Anyone who does Linux kernel development is probably intimately familiar with this picture. I'm not gonna try and go over this too much. I'm just gonna use this as a background for this next chart. So let's, let's put an axis on it and maybe like add some labels, you know, then draw a line. <laughs> and you know, we're pretty much there. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to say this is perfect, so deal with it, but like, this is effectively what's happening. Over here, you've got basically the packets coming in or going out of the kernel. And so there's, there's some operations which are fairly low cost and you can switch you can switch to non exit points pretty fast, um, and you can do some other things. But pretty much going this way or even up is basically becomes you know the cool stuff: doing queuing, uh, passing something to user space, 
although you can do some offload stuff down the boring stuff to get that. Um, this all becomes basically CPU bound pretty quick. So what is cool stuff? Like I, I could go on and on and on about all the each cases there. So let's just talk about the boring stuff. So basically, like I just said, bridging and switching packets for which we already know the destination, we can do that pretty much at line rate, generally. Um, Reading from the NIC hardware via a nappy poll, which is the new API that basically opportunistically polls the hardware, and then you can do stuff while you've got that poll hook. Um, and then there's all the, the offload mechanisms, and there's a lot of them out there. There is a lot of cool stuff happening in this to make more of that, um, that kind of direction up on that graph towards the top um, left-hand corner, basically fast path <coughs> where it was traditionally slow path. Um, interestingly enough, I tried to find like succinct definitions for what fast path was and what slow path is. There is nothing, like there is no standard definition of what that means. Um, so I think my graph is probably as good as you're going to get. Someone who thinks otherwise, please point that out to me. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in this, what's going on right now to make this, these operations faster and being able to do more things, XDP and eBPF, and then the NetDev conference, which the last one was in Seoul, um, they've got a bunch of really good talks. Go and check it out. So here's the thing, though. Being CPU bound shouldn't be a problem. Like, it's kind of the goal. Networks should be matched as close as possible to what I can do in my generalized compute in my environment. Um, my architecture inside the PC is generally packetized already. Why can't I just spread that around? So this is kind of the way I approach it. And I, I do a lot of things with SDN. I do a lot of things with you know, basically user space or, or, or slow path limited operations. So I'm never going to count on the fact that I can get an offload with a particular NIC vendor, which is, you know, what, what we do in the DC. So in the data center, you just told me that you're able to do 25 gig connect. Isn't it the same CPU that's sitting in my you know, PC at home? Yeah. <laughs> so how are they doing it? Well, in the DC, there's almost always some sort of random offload magic going on. Um, and this varies depending on the architecture and the particular NIC model and the switch that's at the top of the rack and what SDM product they potentially have in there and if they're using OpenV switch or SROV. There's a bunch of different caveats. The problem is, is once you do this, you're kind of losing a lot of that cool stuff in the kernel path. Um, you're either losing visibility of the NICs completely in some cases um, from the kernel. And, and there's a lot of things that I would like to do, which are, you know, I don't want to use some proprietary render solution. I want to actually use the kernel path. I just want the kernel path to be able to do that fast enough. And I have my socks fast enough, generally. Um, there is a kind of like hard limit for silicon at the moment. And it turns out it's about 30 gigabit. So basically, 30 gigabit is what, what your slow path worst case is able to support today on a very recent Intel highly clocked CPU like a Xeon Haswell. And that, that's got more to do with the packets per second processing overhead required and how many CPUs you need to support that rate um, than anything else. So let's look at one of these offload approaches because I know you're all really interested. This is a, the Mellanox approach on the X5 series next. So they have this e-switch capability in some of the older stuff, but the X5 is the first one that's actually kind of interesting because you can actually do layer three flow packet marking. Before that with the explorers, you can just like push bridging stuff, which eh, who cares. So this is what we do. My company makes a, this you know, basically open vSwitch enhanced version. Um, it's, a, it's basically mainline. We contribute back up to mainline, but it just has an extra hook on these KV buffer. Your first flow it sees, it does a query, look up to the centralized control, which is this horribly proprietary thing from Alcatel Lucent originally. It's really good, it's industry standard, it's QA, and everyone uses this thing, but, um, and it, so it gives you this really kind of nice model. It's very proprietary though. Um, so basically it sees this, does this lookup, does this extra step of doing this conversion for the Mellanox specific NIC drivers, and they use this mechanism called ASAP2, which is their kind of like enhanced um, protocol for talking to their NICs. Uh, and then pushes the actual entire open vSwitch construct that generally lives in user space into the NIC ASIC at which point the kernel can forget about the network traffic. All it needs to know is that, yeah, okay, there's some stuff that's gone on. At this point, I have no visibility, I don't care about it. 
which if you're passing this through in like a VNF workload to say a mobile packet core virtual machine, is kind of exactly what you want. You're basically using Linux to provision the network and it does nothing else after that point, which you know, for some stuff is kind of what you want to do. And this is really impressive. <laughs> like you can get some really cool results with this. So this is doing line rate, 60 million packets per second with standard consumer Intel silicon um, with almost zero CPU overhead on the kernel. So, you know, with the right stack, you can get some pretty, pretty cool results. But it's horribly proprietary in several places. Well, at least it uses an open API for programming the rules. But yeah, it, you're, you're, you're programming a stack of deceit as far as the kind of m mantra of open source and, and being able to actually work on that in the future and, you know, all, all the good things. The other thing is that your, your home network un, unlikely, except for this gentleman in the front, looks like something like this. Like this is not something that you generally find at home. Maybe there are some exceptions in this room, um, but this is not the normal state of things. You know, it probably looks something more like this. Your computers, a switch of some description, and then some sort of CPE device. That goes to the access provider network, and then the access provider connects you to the rest of the, the world, right? Um, so, so that box, oops, that box is pretty much doing some interesting, very cool stuff 24-7. And, you know, that's not a bad thing, but it just needs to be scaled properly. And right now, 90% of the time it's not. All of the providers' gateway devices that come with the fiber connections both here and in New Zealand are MIPS AR71-based system on a chips. They have a forting path maximum of about 380 megabit. They have some offload tricks with the open fast path stuff, but it's pretty much limited to about that. And you know, once you start doing more and more cool stuff, which is becoming more and more common and even like the standard boring users network, um, that box is just getting pinned down. Right, so what is going on in this area? I've already covered the <coughs> XTP stuff. So the Express Data Path is basically aiming to give you effectively like IP tables mangle rules inside the kernel. Um, you can do some really cool things like with it at right now and it's in mainline as of 4.12 but they're looking at extending more and more actions at the moment. Um, I really suggest you look this up. Layer 7 proxies, this is a religious war I don't want to get into, but it, it basically would, for the TLS stack, it would enable you to do some SSL encryption key exchange offload within the kernel path. Uh, eBPF is really neat, it's basically D-trace on steroids, um, and it's neat, go and check it out. And that's now mainline as of 4.15. Um, and this AF pack extensions, if you're running kernels older than 409, go and upgrade them. Like the 409 and added a whole bunch of really good improvements for um, latency and process packing. Um, and then there's all the vendor specific stuff. There's DBDK, which everyone knows about. There's Qualcomm FastPass, Melox I've talked about. There's our stuff from Nuage. Um, Wind River, Accelerated, Nuage, which is even more patches. Um, but they're pretty much you know, not really interesting. So what are we doing with our gateways? So let's look at Intel. Um, x86 is probably the best platform that you can go to if you want to do a proper open source, fully down, all the way down um, stack. It's widely available. If you're just looking to upgrade that box on your one gig network at home, go and buy $100 in 3160 off AliExpress. These things are easily better than anything that's available in the, the consumer space right now. And they will do five gigabit duplex, slow path, no problems. Um, there's a few enthusiast mainboards that have 10 gig base T on them. Um, unfortunately, they're not really designed to do gateway functions or be low power or low cost. Denverton is Intel's new uh, industrial IO and this is basically where I'm interested in right now. Um, this is basically the right platform for doing this sort of thing. Um, it's still relatively expensive. Rangely was the version before and that's what we use for our SD-WAN boxes. So, um, there's a lot of Rangely stuff out there that's doing this sort of fast packet processing at slow path um, for a lot of SDN WAN applications. Thunderbolt 3, I, I'm sure I heard Thunderbolt 3 in this title. Um, 
yeah, Thunderbolt 3 is a really good option as well. It gives you 40 gig, you can break it out to QSFP and ECP plus NICs, you can get adapters that are like dual, it's, it's actually a really good option. Like you can buy a Nook which has Thunderbolt 3 on it or get an old laptop that has Thunderbolt 3 on it, plug a $400 ECFP QSFP plus adapter into it and suddenly you've got two ports of QSFP plus. It's good. ARM, what's happening in ARM? Pi and SPCs are crap. Like, I see a lot of like, oh, let's make a router or a Wi-Fi AP out of my Raspberry Pi. No, no, do not. <laughs> like, okay, sure, they're fine for like, you know, little like monitoring applications, but as a gateway or a firewall or an IDS or something, it's a terrible idea. They're fine with DNS speed routers, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, most of the, the older, the, the non, cutting edge Pi stuff that is around about 40 megabit, if you're lucky, slow path. It's, it's pretty terrible. Um, the A53 stuff can almost do gigabit now, almost, not quite. Um, and, and most of them just have terrible architecture design, like in terms of the bus um, and expansion options for doing network things. There is an, op there is an up and coming, there's this thing. Um, this is Google sponsored, let's make an SPC that's next generation. Um, it's it's a, a Marvel uh, ARM based chip. I can't remember which ARM architecture it's actually based on. But it has all the things. Like it, it has everything you want. Um, it has mainline kernel support. It's got a good bus lane, provides two SFP plus. As a bonus, you get two gig, 10 gig based T's as well. Um, has a PCI X4 slot. You can probably add wireless to it pretty easily. Uh, and it should be fast enough to do L3 process packet stuff. Um, it's not x86, also a bonus, especially at the moment. Um, and, and it's fanless, should be low power. So it kind of looks like this may be the first SPC system on a chip kind of platform that actually fits <coughs> the description we need for a 10 gig base router. Um, it's got some problems. It's kind of like not really a product. <laughs> you can order it though. Um, they are around 400 to 800 New Zealand dollars. Um, so they're actually at a really good price point too. So if you're thinking of trying this yourself, this is probably what I'd recommend. I don't have one, I've never touched one. I don't know anyone who has one. So if you have one, or you know of someone who does, please get in contact with me, I'd be really keen. Um, so let's just spend the last couple of minutes on Thunderbolt 3, because I know I had that in the title and I know you're all keen to see some nice graphs. But first, let me introduce you to Flint. Flint is a reproducible network tester that does a whole bunch of cool wrapping around kind of the common network tools that we all know and love. So, if you're gonna do benchmarks, I don't wanna see iPerf. iPerf I am tired of seeing. All my network engineers that work with me go and give me iPerf readouts on these like really expensive NICs and, and it's like, all right, that tells me zero because iPerf has got some big problems. Um, NetPerf is a much better option. Unfortunately, it's not packaged by default in Red Hat. Anyone from Red Hat here, get on that. It's been like that for like 10 years now. <laughs> the version that you can find for like scientific OS doesn't have demo mode support. So you, it's useless for, for, for this purpose. The demo mode support flag in NetPerf needs to be enabled because it basically opportunistically reports back stats from the opposite side of the connection. Um, and that's basically how this entire test suite works for, for or its main kind of uh, stuff. So, so Flint is what I use as my test suite when I'm running tests. It's not perfect. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's nothing, it's not like an x year it's not like an aspirant test appliance, but it, it does stuff that those things cost I extra hundreds of thousands to get the layer three modules for. Um, and, and it actually produces really good results. It creates these nice little gzip files that have all the test run stuff, the sys control parameters, the kernel versions, all the window scaling settings, what it was before and after the test, everything you might be interested in looking at that might affect the result is all in these nice little self-contained databases. And um, so this is what I use. I've been using this for about two or three years now. I just wish more people would use it. Um, Thunderbolt, what does it do? Here's a bit of an overview. Um, so as of this year, it's now completely royalty and license free. So the, the, there was this perception um, that it was like this Intel technology or an Apple technology 
Um, sure, it had a weird start where Apple co-sponsored Intel and then Intel bought the branding rights for Thunderbolt trademark back off Apple. It was very confusing. Um, but that was a while ago now. Thunderbolt 3 is matured and it's pretty good. Um, it doesn't have like a weird bus host architecture like USB. It pretty much gives you access to the PCIe 4 bus channels on your motherboard directly into that bus with almost no processing. Um, it's really low latency. It gives you 40 gig of combined channel access. And you get a 10 gig network interface that's basically standardized. So I can plug this laptop into a Mac, into a Windows laptop, and it all just works. Like you get like a, a 10 gig network link straight away for free. No extra wells, no adapters required. You just get it. Um, it uses a USB style connector. Uh, you know, these are the kind of links you generally see them in at the moment. Um, but these are, these are becoming more and more common. There's obviously some caveats around the cabling standards for USB-C and Thunderbolt, but you know, whatever. Um, you can get it as an add-in card. Like you don't have to have it integrated with your motherboard day one. Um, and it's not limited to Intel chipsets. It's just really rare at the moment to see it on anything else. Um, there's no reason this has to be on an Intel chip. You could put this on an ARM. You could put it onto anything with a PCIe X bus. Um, and you can get SFP Plus and QSP Plus adapters. Like, oh my God, there is, that's the only thing you can do right now. There is, there is no other technology that allows you to do this. So this means you can walk into a data center with your laptop, with your little adapter box, and plug into the DC switch through the front panel. Has anyone done that before? Hey, I'm the only person in the room who's ever done this. Why? Why, because you've got an entire cluster to bootstrap. <laughs> And because your clients generally don't have decent infrastructure to do that stuff themselves. So you end up having to build infra and you either do that through a BMC or a crappy laggy VNC connection, or you go and walk in with your laptop and dump a couple of EM images and spin the entire thing up. So it's, um, it, yeah, th there are some use cases for it. And I, I, I have these use cases, which is why I kind of was really excited about Thunderbolt when I saw it. Um, you can get long run optical cables as well. I've never seen one in the flesh, but they exist apparently. Um, so, so that's that's an option as well. And, and there, I can hear people. Well, oh, no, USB C, it's already there. It's a standard. USB C slash USB three have some problems. Um, they had an opportunity to introduce a standardized network model with a three point two spec that was ratified last year, and they passed it over. Don't know why. So there's no like standardized network stack for USB at the moment. You can obviously you can create a user space gadget or something in the kernel to do this. Uh, this is not rocket science. We've been doing this for a long time. But, you know, that you know, introduces a lot of its own problems. Um, it's actually only short run copper. So, you know, this, this length of cable is all USB 3 FL super speed, which is the 10 gig, the 20 gig channel stuff, is all you, you, that you're ever going to get. Um, so, yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. What do you think? <laughs> Out of these two technologies, if you had a choice, which one would you choose? Um, I know which one I'm going for at this point. So right now, Thunderbolt 3 offers actually the best path to 10 gig plus in, in your home network, hands down. There is no actually other no real option, except for building a bunch of random boxes in the corner, making lots of noise, consuming huge amounts of power with existing server nodes. Um, and, and you know, that's, that's not really where we want to be. That's how wireless access points and things were back in like 1998 and 2001. And you know, it just, it just doesn't scale. So show me, what does it look like? So this is the, this is the current patch that I'm running right now. Um, actually, one of these <coughs> test nodes is this laptop. Um, so this is a, the kind of like the baseline test I do before I start doing any benchmarking work. And this is just a, a, a local round trip time measurement. So how accurately can the CPU sleep? And so for, there's actually a big difference between Skylake and Kaby Lake, like regardless of all the other architectural enthusiast discussions. Kaby Lake seems to be able to more accurately time sleep events at, um, at 100 nanoseconds compared to Skylake. Um, so the mean error at 100 nanoseconds, and this is consistent, like I get this all the time. So I don't know what they changed there, but 100 nanoseconds on, on, on Kaby Lake Plus architecture is actually way more accurate than it has been on Intel stuff before. Anyway, so that's kind of like just giving you an idea of some of the test suites I've been running. 
And this is now, this, this actually has the KPTI kernel patch sets, which was a question someone asked me earlier. So this is the, this is the local loopback test. This is the plots. Um, so this is the rule test suite, which is actually four up, four down, different cross markings on each stream, and then a bunch of UDP and ICMP probes, again, with different cross markings on them. Um, so what we're trying to do is work out when we load up the CPUs and, and, the, and the pipe, what happens to our latency, because that tells us a lot. So localhost over current gen uh, KB Lake, basically my latency to the local CPU with, through the network stack is around about 100, 150 microseconds. Um, the axis on the side is in milliseconds, but it's microseconds, just move the zero. Um, and yeah, you, you've got about 100 gig of bandwidth on, on current gen. So components that are actually part of the kernel, you have the Thunderbolt handler, that's a module that's loaded, that deals with basically mapping, because everything in Thunderbolt is a PCI route, it's basically like you just plugged a new PCI card in. So you have to basically manage those memory reasons, so this is this, the main handler does that. Um, you have this networking module, which is Thunderbolt Net, which operates completely independently from the other bit of Thunderbolt. There is these security levels because you're getting direct access via our external thing. So there is this whole security ACL um, where you can like basically approve and, and, and dis disallow devices. And there's this firmware update thing, which annoyingly just got released this week. I haven't had time to play with it. And this hooks into the FW update stuff that's been going into mainline for a bunch of different things. So this is TBD admin, which is the main thing you'll use. Basically, I attach something. In this case, it's this dock that I'm connecting in through at the moment. Um, it shows you there's something attached. What do you want to do with it? I'm approving it. There's a UDF hook part of this user space that then adds an ACL for that device. And then it's authorized. You do an LS PCI. If, you've got a, if it's a PCI-style device, um, you'll get new stuff. So I think from here down. That, that is all what was on the dock. So there was a USB 3 controller, there's a NIC card, um, some, some other bits and pieces, but that all just starts appearing as if it's local to your machine. Like it's basically you've hot plugged a PCI device. <coughs> so this is my experience from a year of use. Um, it generally just works. Like I've had a few problems with it. It's not been completely, completely uh, issue free. Um, there were some problems with the way that the PCI address maps get allocated sometimes, and that would cause some pretty horrible crashes. Um, I've tested pretty much every feature that Thunderbolt has, including the DisplayPort stuff, which I've never actually ever used, um, but I've tested it. Sometimes the network model gets confused generally after this has been resumed, but it's probably my laptop's fault rather than the Thunderbolt stuff. Um, I wish there was some more, was it actual just a, a switch of six ports, because the, the cabling problem is not, I don't find that particularly nice. And I wish the optical cables. But the latency is amazing, like literally amazing. So this is, this is a very similar sort of graph to the one I showed you, except it's just plotted as lines. And you'll see that there is literally around about 50 to 100 nanoseconds difference between the local CPU and a Thunderbolt connected NIC. So I'm out of time, but this, this kind of sums it up. This down here is where we're at, bandwidth, latency. That's what I can do localhost, that's the goal. I want my network to be as fast as what my local PC is doing. Thanks. And thank you very much, Joel. And here's a token of appreciation. Ah, cheers. Uh, so I think, uh, you call out a question so you get chocolate.